Toxic Gumbo, written by Lydia Lunch, illustrated and colored by Ted McKeever, published by DC Comics Vertigo, 1998. Willows wept for water, their sad branches as brittle as old bones, bent and broken, bowed to kiss the ground, begging for mercy. No mercy was granted. A plague of locusts, biblical in proportion, warned of my impending birth. Their crusted carcasses clung to every leaf, twig, and flower. They blanketed the highways, a hungry platoon of screeching beasts whose horrible sing-song did not cease. My poor mother, it drove her insane, irritated her already nervous condition. She was eight days away from giving birth to me. She was in the backyard, throwing her fists in the air, cursing angrily at a god so cruel, so ruthless, that he would allow yet another disaster to befall her. First, her beloved husband, my father, stricken just months before with yellow fever. Dead now, but life support aborted, the rent check overdue, and no clue as to how to provide for a child this late in life. She of the religious fervor usually reserved for saints was tapped. She spat up at the sky that if God had given up on her, she was giving up on him. That's when the convulsion started. My mother collapsed, thrashing wildly, swallowing her tongue, a frightening spectacle. The next door neighbor, an ageless Creole priestess, ran out to investigate the commotion. Tula was convinced my mother had been given the evil eye, that a spell of some sort must have been cast, causing the contractions that would hasten my birth. My mother went into toxic shock an extremely rare repercussion. In truth, she had an allergic reaction to the insidious bite of a stinging caterpillar, an ungodly creature indigenous to the deep south, whose petulant mouth commonly causes a small, irritating rash. Tula, bless her heart, pulled out all the tricks she knew in a failed attempt to save my mother. She split a young hen open, slicing a deep gorge in its belly, placing it gently on my mother's head. Squeezed a huge slimy frog in my mother's right hand until its eyes popped out, rolling on the grass like small black marbles. Rubbed alligator fat on the swell of my mother's belly, hoping to cease the contractions. Nothing worked. She was forced to call the hospital. An ambulance arrived quickly, but not before I had already poked my head out, using tiny fists, urgent to pummel my way out. I was plopped out on a bloody gurney in the back of the battered van. My first vision was a panicked attendant, wiping my placenta on his filthy white overcoat. He was screaming for the driver to speed up. My blood was burning his fingers. I was born hallucinating, a vortex of colored lights melting shapes and forms into unrecognizable patterns, a side effect of my mother's poisoning. From birth, I was starved for the affection every child needs in order to develop lasting bonds and intimacies. I would live to forever blame her for my feelings of rejection, loss and loneliness, for dying on me. My mother never regained consciousness, slipping into a coma whose liquid embrace surrendered her over to the other side on the third day of her stay in room 313. I was kept in quarantine for my first two months of life. The doctors marveled that I was a medical miracle, a freak of nature, couldn't understand how I appeared so healthy 
yet my temperature never dropped below 106 degrees. Already other. Anyone else would have spontaneously combusted, yet my flesh was cool to the touch. Cold almost. And my eyes so yellow, so black. Tula, of course, realized my unusual orbs mimicked the hues of my mother's killer, the Louisiana Pus Moth. She paid visits to my postnatal prison, praying to black goddesses for my recovery. Then her visits mysteriously stopped. Abandoned, yet again. I was placed in an orphanage, the Temple of Innocent Blood, an aging, dilapidated mansion on the outskirts of the French Quarter run by naughty nurses whose twisted vision of discipline meant twice weekly group spankings. Obediently, we'd line up in single file, touch our toes, bear down and receive five or six whacks with a birch branch soaked in vinegar, supposedly meant to punish us for the sins of our birth. I grew quite fond of this little ritual, knowing it built character, stamina, endurance. The vinegar was actually cooling to my wounds. Then we'd be sent to the library to sit on hardback chairs as we silently mouthed ten Hail Marys and recited the rosary. Our battered bottoms would find no relief from prayer. The only reward was Sister Teresa. She was the librarian whose angelic face and saintly smile momentarily replaced the mothers we would never know. But the less I cried, the less attention I got, as if my strength and resolve were being punished. Crushing unfair. All of our clothes, food and toys came from local donations. One Christmas a chemistry set was left under the tree. I confiscated it as my own. Set up a small lab in an abandoned shed which bordered the backyard. I would examine bodily fluids. Urine, saliva, tears, excrement, even blood. First my own, then from other orphans who could be bribed with pilfered food. But my interest in other children quickly faded. They couldn't be trusted with my secret experiments. Besides, my own blood appeared unique. I was delighted. In the secrecy of my lab, I would revel in my discoveries. Always knew I was different from the others, now I knew why. Genetics, chemistry, bloodlines. The pulsing corpuscles assumed mysterious shapes which constantly mutated. Psychedelic science. Something I could finally sink my teeth into. My own flesh and blood became the canvas on which to experiment. But of course, I needed additional subjects. My attention soon turned to insects and small animals. Palmettos, fireflies, lizards, toads, field mice. I'd lay sticky traps of honeyed chicken bones salvaged from the neighbor's garbage. With the precision of a budding surgeon, I would dissect and disembowel the captured prey, decoding blood types, logging temperatures, keeping precise notes on time of death versus loss of blood. Like any decent scientist or witch doctor, my experiments were done in secret. I'd sneak out under the bloodshot moon, after everyone else had fallen asleep, and escape into my laboratory, where I'd lose myself for hours. My bloody companions, a mute witness to my developing prowess. I began to experiment with insect and animal mash. A moonshine fermented like corn liquor, I'd grind their inner organs with rubbing alcohol, sugar, and blood. A horrible concoction which resulted in a gritty paste. The longer I'd allow the flavors to meld, the more potent the brew became. I decided to dose Sister Agnes, the cruel and vindictive headmistress. I spiked her coffee. She never knew what hit her. Began clawing at her face and neck, running in circles like a mad dog swearing and cursing and tearing free from her tattered robes, fleeing naked through the backyard. An ambulance was summoned. She never returned. Her attack was blamed on religious delusions. 
The atmosphere in the orphanage improved with her removal. I was never the same. Too aware of the power to pervert through elementary science. <laughs>